Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 188 for Monday, November 5th, 2018. folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians who you know you've listened, or if not, welcome. Actually, even if you have listened, welcome. Here welcome. in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, Paul Kent. How you doing today, Mr. Kent? I'm doing good, Mr. Hamilton. How you doing? I'm good. We are recording this early because of some travel, so it's really only been a few days since our last uh show but or a last episode but uh but actually lots has gone on at least in in my world my uh, october ended paul and i realized um you know i played a gig on halloween night a madhouse gig that i want to talk about but as i got home from that i realized that there was at least one set actually it was the same set of drums yeah there was one set of my drums that was not home at all for the month of october <laughs> Because <laughs> I got home had a after. road trip. It had yeah, they had a road trip, and there were there were like four gigs. I did a fling gig, and then right from the fling gig, I went and loaded in at the theater f at UNH uh, for if then at the University of New Hampshire, and then right from that, I loaded into the theater for Brechtones, and then right from that, I loaded in to the theater for Madhouse, and then finally after Madhouse on on uh, Halloween night, I brought my drums home, <laughs> and so and and. It's two things were nice. Number one, I got to go to sleep knowing all my drums and me were, you know, safe here at home. And number two, as I went to sleep, I did not know off the top of my head when my next gig was. And that was kind of a nice thing. And not that I had overloaded, but I had overloaded, you know. And so it was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I actually have a weekend free. Like, I can spend time with my family. I get to see my kid do, pl play a hockey game on Saturday that <laughs> I have missed. It'll be the first one of the year, and he's played like four. <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, uh, it's okay not knowing when the next gig is. I know there is one. It's actually a couple of weeks, but that's okay. It is weird. We start to take for granted weekend nights, and some of us... If you take it for granted too much, our significant others will let us know in no uncertain terms. No uncertain you know? terms. Yes. Yeah. And so, though, you know, when when you play a lot and all of a sudden there's a hole, do something good with that with that uh, with that hole. Do something with your family. Do something with your friends. You yeah. Know? Live a little. Don't don't just look at it as a, as a night off in the middle of the week because the rest of the world continues to move forward on the weekend. On the weekends. Yeah, exactly. And for me, with um, y you know, with all the gigs that I had, it wasn't just gigs. Um, on the weekends, but it was two of those weeks in October were tech weeks and they happened to be two in a row, but that meant that, you know, there were no evenings that I was home for, you know, for many, many, many days there. So, yeah. So it's, yeah. Make sure you carve out time for life. Yep. <laughs> Even though life on stage is, it's interesting. You know, I found, I spent a lot of time on stage in October and I, I found that you know, it, 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 even though it's a weird place, we've talked about this before, you know, where everybody can see you and you're very exposed. Like it, it truly is a place where I am. I am extremely comfortable and, and in some ways, like the most comfortable just being up there. It feels it, it, comfortable is the wrong word. Safe on, on stage, which I know sounds strange to someone that that w doesn't play or doesn't, you know, do something that puts you on stage. But. It really is. It's just like, oh yeah, okay, oh cool. I'm here now. Great. You're connected. I'm connected. Yeah, I'm. I'm where I'm supposed to be. Everything's good. It, you know, I, I, I can just relax and and play, which is which is cool. Yeah, it's, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I know you do. Yes, <laughs> and I know most of our listeners do, but I also know we have some listeners that are, you know, fans of music and and not necessarily performers. And it it it, but it's still. Like it, it still surprises me. Like I get a chuckle out of it when I sit down and it's like, you know, there's a house full of people. They're waiting for the show to start or whatever. And I sit down and it's like, ah, oh, <sighs> comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Even though all eyes are on me. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, I think it's something that you, that you actually grow into when, once you yes. play enough, I yes. think even, you know, a lot of people who have stage fright, you know, clinical stage fright, or just aren't really comfortable in their own shoes performing, you do it enough and you kind of, 
figure out the flow to things, you know, yeah. everything from load in to set up to, you know, that moment before where you get a little moment to yourself, to the anticipation that builds or, you know, the way, however you assess the room, these all become part rote of, things, you yeah, know, and part they, of the they, dance. Yeah. They're, yeah. And there's a certain comfort zone to every part of it too. It's so and maybe true. it connects back to, you know, you get the reflection in the middle of loading in, driving to a gig, setting up, sound checking, Every once in a while you get the reflection, I'm really lucky to be doing this, right? You get a a sense of humility that this is something not everybody gets to do. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a real cool thing. And it kind of, it does, it's a, there's a soothing element to it. Yeah. Once you get comfortable to it, I, you know, some people are are comfortable right from the beginning. It's what they were born to do. Other people have to, you know, do it enough, like many things to kind of make it a second nature, but you get these really interesting reflections, but I get it totally. You know, there's a, I told you that, you know, there's a, Mike Campbell shared that, uh, you know, the heartbreakers are going through a difficult time and, you know, when Petty wasn't feeling well and he leaned over and he said, up here, nobody can touch us. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. in front of 30, 40,000 people. Right? right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's true. It's like, oh, this is our safe spot, it, which is weird, but it, it's true. Yeah. It, it And that said, there are times and often times and many times in the last month where I have been about to go on stage. Once I'm on stage, I'm good. But right as I'm about to go on to perform, I often get, I don't, I don't, it's certainly not stage fright. Butterflies. Butterflies. Yeah. That feeling that it's a, you know, a mild anxiety. It's not debilitating or anything, but, but something that essentially reminds me that I care about what I'm about to do and that I want to get it. I only get that now. Interestingly, I only get that now when there's like, People I went to school that I haven't seen for 30 years or something mm. like that. You know, oh, that's the sure. only time it's really weird for me. Uh, you know, family, all good. Current friends, all good. Yep. People I don't know, all good. But people who I haven't seen in a long time, you know, especially if there's a group of them, that's the only time I'm aware that my body is talking to me. Yeah. That, you know, I'm about to do something that has some risk associated there's, with yeah, it. Yeah, I want to <laughs> get it right. There's risk. So it, it's interesting, right? We walked out. Uh, we were about to walk out on stage for Madhouse on Halloween. And I felt that. And Madhouse is so it's always a Madhouse, right? There is never usually there's never enough time to rehearse everything, to get comfortable. And every song that we're playing in in Madhouse is the only time we're playing that song. Right. So. As we're going through the show, you know, we in the band have learned to kind of, you know, chuckle to each other if if a song doesn't go quite right. And there's a lot that can go wrong. Like, not only is there an opportunity for the band to, you know, F it up, but there's singers and <laughs> there are people moving things. And like, I mean, it's not just singing and dancing. There are things like you know, big props that are moving and we do like shadow puppet. We don't do them. We're playing our instruments, but other people are doing shadow puppets along to the story. I mean, it's just like, it's in, it's mayhem, right? You know? And, and so there's lots that can go wrong. And once we get to the end of a song, the nice part is there's no reason to like make a note about, Oh, Hey, next time we should do like this because that way we could get that song better. There is no next time, whether it was perfect or a disaster it's in the past. Right. And we move on. And certainly there are lessons to be learned, you know, like, Oh, okay. Maybe we should, you know, in general, if there's a song with a click track, we should do this thing with it so that it's not a problem next time, you know, whatever. But other than those general lessons, there's nothing to to worry about. It's like, well, that song's done. doesn't matter. Move on. And, um, and, and like I said, there's, there's rarely enough time to rehearse everything with this particular madhouse. Uh, we had plenty of time to rehearse. We rehearsed <laughs> everything on Sunday and then we got there at about four, four thirty on Wednesday and ran through everything that we needed to run through. It was a relatively short madhouse. It, it happened after that parade. I told you in Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, So it was intended to be a one act. It really was. We only played 90 minutes. I think it actually was the shortest Madhouse, even though we've had others that were supposed to be 90 minutes and turned into two and a half hour, two act kind of things. But um, before we went on, we were really prepared, you know, like we'd run things. We had more time than we needed. But before we went on stage, it was like I felt those butterflies more so than most times. 
Too and, much to think? Too much and, time to think? And I think there was that, right? There was too much time to think. There wasn't this mad rush five minutes before we went on stage that to, you know, fix something or discuss something and then just race out and go do it. So, yes, too much time to think. But also, this time, for the first time, we had a band that... It's going to sound egotistical, but it's it's not meant to sound that way. Um, I it, but it, it's a great way to describe how I feel about this band. It's not obvious who the weakest player on stage is, right? Mm-hmm. In, in, in we've had situations in the past. We've always had good players, but there's always somebody that's the weakest. Not maybe, maybe not necessarily technically as a player, but in terms of their. Uh, interest slash time slash ability to prepare for the gig or just their, their presence on stage in terms of having big ears and, you know, knowing like I knew I could trust every, it was just four of us, which makes life easier. Keyboard, guitar, bass, and drums. I knew I could trust every one of them to listen. If there was a, you know, a train wreck or wobbly train or whatever, I knew that (laughs) everybody would be aware that the train was wobbly. You know what I mean? And, and like know to tune in and, and sync up. And, uh, and we had a new keyboard player, uh, this woman named Susie who has been music directing some other shows at the theater and she can play really play. Um, but, and, and she had not done anything outside of sheet music for about the past two or three years. And Madhouse is not sheet music for the most part. It's just, you know, chords charts and, and we're playing, you know, rock songs or whatever. And, uh, and so she was having fun with it, being able to sort of detach from the sheet music side of things. But, but again, she had that, that ability in, uh, in, in her arsenal, she had done these kinds of things in the past. And so she, you know, she knew how to follow a chord chart and just like jam and have fun. And this guitar player that we brought in for the first time last Madhouse was there. And then Jamie, the bass player and me who have been there basically, well, definitely since the beginning. And it really was, we walked out and it was like, Oh, Holy crap. Like I might be the weakest player on stage. Like that's awesome. I would love that. You know, um, everybody was really good and really could play and listened. And, and so I, a- I knew, I think some of the butterflies were that I knew that we had more potential walking on stage than we've ever had before. And it was like, Oh, we could actually get this right. Like in the past, it's always been like, well, however it goes is fine. This time it was like, actually, we can sort of, I can raise my internal bar a little bit because yeah, this might, cool. you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a new level here, which is great. And and we so have you know the same that Ronstadt show actually. that we did recently. Yeah. I told you about, right. Yeah. So those are some really heavy players. Those are, you know, about as good as you can pull from in, in my, in my pool around here. Yeah. And having a chat with one of the people who played, I'm not going to say man or woman. And they said, you know what? This is a real trip for me. And it's a, a total pleasure in all humility that I can muster. I've been the best person, best musician, most trained musician in the various bands that I've been up to this point. And, you know, that's cool. You know, sure. I, you know, work hard and that type of thing. It's a really uh, comforting thing not to feel like you have to carry and pull the boat, you know, and, you know, everybody on stage is capable of that. Everybody on stage will will do what they need to do. And, and we, his reflection, there was humility in it. I mean, he, he wasn't yes. bragging that he was the best person <laughs> in every band he played. I guess I let it out that he's a he. But um, but uh, that there was a certain comfort to the fact that everybody on stage was a monster. And yeah. uh, what that what that felt like. We don't get those types of chances too often. No. At the semi-professional level. No. And I, you know, to to. Uh, to the credit of, and to my absolute delight, but certainly to the credit of all the musicians uh, in the area, I, I had a lot of those moments in October. The, the Brecktones band was the same way. It was like everybody was just a monster. It was like, oh man, yeah, this is this is what I love. Is your area a particularly fertile area for for good musicians? Are they are they you know cats who moved out of New York City? Are they are they is there you know music things happening in your town that attracts good talent? Do you think your area is al- average in terms of the pool? I mean, above average? It's hard to say. You know, I've I've lived in several places, in, you know, including Austin, Texas. I've lived near close enough to New York to really have that influence, you know, on a regular basis there. And I, you know, I think. It, certainly there are great players here. I think part of that is Portsmouth, uh, 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 you know, has enough of an arts scene that, that people can play and actually, you know, get that 
exercise that part of their being. So, you know, it, it, it gives you something to do while you're here sort of thing and a reason to stay. There's another town over called Dover that uh, that has a, a similar but different sort of scene. And, and they have had, you know, different scenes over the years. So, yeah, I mean, there's enough here to attract and keep decent players. But there's also average and crappy players here, just like there are average and crappy players in New York and average and crappy players in Austin. Um, you know, I haven't lived in L.A. And, you know, I'm thinking back to our interview with with Buddy Gibbons, where he said, you know, living in L.A. or playing in L.A. Yeah, you've got you know, you've got crappy people. You've got middle of the road people, he says, mm -hmm. but you also have literally the best players mm -hmm. here. You know, um, I haven't I, ha I haven't lived in a and played in a town where Vinnie Kaliuta plays. And maybe that's why I continue to get gigs where I live. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, I, I am willing to work cheaper than Vinnie, I'm sure. So there you go. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I think there's, you know, there's good musicians here. And a lot of it is getting into the right circles with them because, you know, not, not because people are egotistical or, uh, intentionally aloof, but good players want to play with, with people that can hold their own. You, do. you don't necessarily have to, yeah. it's great to play with people that are better than you. I, I think, right. But, but it's okay when you realize, Oh, I'm the best person on this gig. Well, that's fine. If everybody else can still play, well, then, then there's fun to be had and things to learn, right. You know, always. But if you've got really weak players on a gig, then that, you know, the weakest link of the chain really does set the bar in, in not a good place. And so I can see where if you're not known to the people that can play, even whether, even if you can play, you might not get into those circles. And I, and I've experienced that here and everywhere else, you know, as you kind of move to a new area, it's like, Oh yeah, I got to, you know, kind of start at the beginning and work my way in and, and let people hear me and, Oh, okay. All right. That's, that's who you are. Great. Okay. I, now I have an idea, you know? And, and so, yeah. Yeah, but you got good players in your area too. I mean, it's we do, and remember, our, our area is kind of interesting. It has a lot of the working players here are musicians who have been working here for a long time. I'm amazed that that, um, yeah, that, that community is still thriving. They're still working. They're still, you know, going after their craft, and you know, but living in an area where there's so many smart people. So in Silicon Valley, you know, a lot of these engineers and sure. it's really interesting to me that there's a lot of just accomplished people who music has been a part of their life. And, you know, they don't quite have the time to do things even part-time, much less full-time, Right. but they float around in your community. All of a sudden someone will walk into an open mic or a jam or a sit-in and you'll be like, who the heck was that? And, uh, you know, oh, you know, it's a software engineer at Apple or something like that. And, yeah, right. and there, there are a lot of guys like that that are kind of floating around here. And also there's just a lot of people here. Sure. So yeah. the one thing that I it's noticed though game. is that yeah. it is a numbers game like anything else. I mean, you know, why, why, you know, why do you get so many great, athletes from certain foreign populations because every, you know, one in the DR is playing baseball type of thing. And so you, you know, you tend to get, you know, a, a concentration on a certain skill set and the cream rises to the top, I think. So, um, that, I didn't mean that to be a weird generalization, right. but no, yeah, but, it makes sense. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Um, uh, yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of musicians around here. There are a lot of very good musicians. There's not, a very vibrant live music scene around here. I mean, the, the God bless the ones who are, who are still hosting venues for it, but mm -hmm. it's just, uh, and I, I have a lot of thoughts about why it is. I mean, also this is an intensely multicultural place. Um, so many different cultures live here. I wonder if for kids coming up through high school now, whether there's a common reference for music or whether their life is, you know, the, the kind of like cultural music that is to their family and then a plethora of things to choose from that is on the radio or on YouTube or wherever they find music. Now, I it, it seems like there's not there's just not that many young bands coming up. There's a it, I would call uh, is it is that is, is that. Only is that limited by your access to those people like I, I've I'm. Let me ask this a different way. I've been very aware of a lot of the young musicians and young bands coming up because through my kids, right? If it weren't for me having kids in high school and middle school, I never would have 
encountered these these bands. I mean, it, you know, I'm I'm in my 40s. It would be weird if I was hanging out with 17 year olds, you know, and, and yeah. there wasn't a connection there. Right. So I, I wonder if if for me, you know, six, seven, eight, nine years from now, will I still be aware? Will I be aware of any of these high school bands? I, you know, probably not. I would assume. Well, I look I, at it like the festivals often have true. A, yeah, a youth fair. band stage type of thing. And, yeah. and uh, you know, there, there's just not a lot of under 18, under 21 clubs, you know, or venues for, for people to play. So it just seems to me like it's, it's not quite as vibrant. There's an okay live music um, community here. Um, more obviously in San Francisco than down in the South Bay. But um, how about your area? Is there a lot of, is there a lot of live rock music, original rock music, not, not singer songwriter stuff, but, but uh, like venues and places where original, I would think in a college town, you would always have some, right? Yeah, there, there is. It's not like venues and stuff are tough. It's weird. There's not a lot of live music that happens in Durham, which is bizarre to me. Like when I was in college, <clears throat> there were a ton of live music venues and we played all of them and then made up some others, you know, it was just kind of how it went. But, um, but in Portsmouth and Dover, there are, there are quite, there's quite a bit of original rock music happening. Um, but, but not a ton of venues for that to happen. It, it, you know, there's limited venues and then, and then I'm aware of, you know, lots of different bands kind of doing stuff. So yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 Oh. Well, cool. What do you got going this week? Uh, well, this week actually, I'm heading to LA. I'm uh, the other the other part of my brain has to work. I, I'm speaking at a conference called Mac Tech out there, oh, yeah. teaching people about Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. Very so cool. if you're in LA, <laughs> what's that? The other part of <laughs> the my other brain. part of your brain. I like that. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, so there you go. But we did get a question in that sort of relates to uh, some of the things we've been talking about here. Uh, listener Kevin writes. He says. Dave and Paul, I am trying to get involved as a theater drummer for musicals. Can slash would you share some some advice on things I need to prepare for and avoid? He says, I haven't been in an orchestra environment since high school, so there will be a bit of a learning curve. He says, but being able to read music should help. He says, in fact, I can't see how a drummer can survive in a theater pit without that skill. And he says, by the way, if I get in, my first show would be Newsies, which is uh, that's fun. It's fun music. That's great. Um yeah, so you're totally right. I can't imagine doing traditional theater uh, without being able to read music. Like, it, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I do know, as I was sort of pondering this question, I, I do know of one group of musicians, well, a guitar player in particular, who played in, quote unquote, The Pit for a production of The Who's Tommy about 10 years ago. And he doesn't really read music, so he charted everything but, you know, part of the problem with musical theater and just charting like rock charts is that there are cues that happen and the songs get changed. Even if it's a song, you know, like, you know, for example, the soundtrack to Tommy, there are things that, that you know, the, the one section might be eight bars long instead of four, or it might be eight bars plus a vamp because you don't know you're waiting for a line cue. And, and, and other times it might be, you know, there's an eight bar phrase happening. But at bar three and a half, you got to stop because there's a, a an event happening on stage and then you resume and now you're in the middle of bar six or, you know, something like that. And so without being able to read music, even if you had a lot of time to prepare and the information with which to prepare again, remember in a theater pit, you know, the way you get the information is somebody hands you the book. It, it, it would be very difficult to get through that without reading music, but these guys did it and they kind of rehearsed it as a rock band and learned it. But again, in Tommy, you know, you're playing all the way through. It's a, it's a sort of a unique musical in that sense. Right. Um, it, so in terms of, of preparing, I, I think uh, if you can go on, if you can get the sheet music for, and this, you know, doesn't just apply to drummers, but anybody, if you're looking to get involved in theater and you're wondering, you know, what's, do I have what it takes or what do I need to prepare? I would say go online and if you can download Scribd, S-C-R-I-B-D dot com is a great place for downloading uh, sheet music for musicals that lots of things are there. You might not be able to find exactly what you want, but just go find, you know, the drum part or the guitar part or the trumpet part or whatever it is for 
a musical, perhaps something that's similar to what you're looking for if you can't find exactly that. And just read it down and start playing it and get the cast recording. Play so I'm going to actually take this on a little bit of okay. a left turn because this yeah. is this is relevant to my life in a different way, right? Yeah. So I have a horn band and my horns read charts. Mm -hmm. and And I knew enough music when I put the band together that I could count measures. Sure. Uh, but largely I was a lead sheet guy, not, which is different than reading music, right? Correct. So lead sheet is kind of like forms and, you know, you scribbled notes to yourself. And, yes. You know, I don't think there's a, is there a formal definition for a lead sheet or is it mean something different to everybody? I think it can mean a lot of different yeah. things. Whatever but gets you through the song. It's whatever right. gets you through the tune. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I will say this, um, uh, having a basic idea of how to count measures and how to at least read roadmap signs on a, on a formal piece of sheet music yes. is a, is a core skill and you can get, you can actually get it pretty far away. So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, I can't, I can't sight read the music and play the notes in real time like these guys can, but I can understand what they're doing. And when, uh, you know, someone charts something for me and they send it to me, I can play it. I can play the original song and follow along on the chart. Yes. And, you know, and so roadmap, I think, is is a, is a very, very core skill that you have to have. A absolutely. Yeah. And and you need to be able to follow a conductor, um, it, you know, for a theater gig. You're either most of the time you're not going to have a dedicated conductor. Ninety nine percent of the time it's going to be the piano player yeah. is the music director. And so they are a playing conductor, meaning they're not going to have time to, you know, think through things. Also be prepared for no count offs for many songs. Like you'll just get a head nod and that's the one, right? That's the downbeat. It it's it's rare to get a full like one, two, one. <laughs> like there's just not time for that. You, you know, a, a lot of times you're waiting for a line cue and then you're just in. So make sure you can really hear that piano player because that's the person that's going to be telling you via their their performance what tempo you're supposed to play at, right? So the drummer does not set these things. You're always following somebody. You are conducted through it. Yeah, I mean, very rarely will I, you know, they'll yeah, certainly I can pick out, you know, departure moments from this where somebody's like, okay, yeah, start that tune. But but most of the time, no. And if I'm supposed to start a tune, then yes, the piano player will count me in. They, you know, they might just give me three, four. Sometimes if you're lucky, like, you know, they'll say, I'll give you four for nothing. It's like, well, four whole beats. This is amazing. <laughs> like, but, but that's a departure, right? Just, but, but, you know, there's some tunes that the drums start and even those, most of those, I, I don't count myself in. I am conducted in because yeah. as, as, the drummer and as anybody other than the, the music director, which again is normally the piano player, you are not aware. You will walk into that first rehearsal after the cast and the, the, the piano player have been rehearsing this together for weeks, if not months. And so that piano player knows what's going to happen and what the cast needs and the flow of your particular you know, production of that musical Newsies is going to need. And it might be that, you know, uh, song number 14, you know, measures 75 through 79 are repeated three times. And even though it's not written in the score, right? They know that they know the tempos that these people need because they know, oh, there's different blocking and, oh, we've got a scene change or a costume change that we've got to account for and that sort of stuff. So you really don't have enough information to just walk in and, and read the book. You have to follow this person. And that's why they're the right ones to conduct you through. If, you know, if, if the drums are starting a tune, if I start it too fast or too slow, like I don't, I haven't worked with this particular cast uh, doing that, you know, dance number long enough to, to feel that in my bones, but the music director either has, or sometimes a music director will have like a little, you know, little metronome with them or whatever to give them, you know, to give them the, that feel. And then, and then in we go. So yeah, you are, you are a tool yeah. in the arsenal of the, the entire production and, and be ready for that. Like if you've been doing rock gigs where it's kind of sort of about you all night, get rid of that, that the theater gigs are not about you. And, and that's okay. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, when you take a step back to think about it, it makes sense. But, um, it, now, the the big thing, once you've sort of got those skills and you know what to expect, the big thing about theater drumming is getting your foot in the door. 
for Kevin, it sounds like he's sort of already got that. If he's saying, if I get in my first show, will be newsies. That's you're, you're already way ahead of the game, moving to a new place or whatever. You know, the theater world is built on a lot of trust as, as most things in life are. And you don't get a lot of rehearsals, right? If you know, it might be that the cast rehearses for a month and a half, and then you get two rehearsals with the band and then it's, it's opening night, right? So the music director is going to hire people that they know and they trust that can just walk in and do that. They don't want to have to babysit anybody on the first dress rehearsal. Right. Sure. That, and, and so you've got to get your foot in the door with these people somehow. And, you know, a lot of times people will be very open to this because, you know, generally these gigs don't pay a whole lot. So they need to sort of have a big pool of, of people that they can draw from because you're not going to be able to just, you know, give somebody enough work to, to, to pay their bills or whatever. So you know, if you walk in and you you meet a music director or a guitar player and you say, "Hey, I'm a drummer and I want gigs," they might they might be like, "Oh, cool," and put you on on their you know on their call list. But if you walk in and tell the drummer there that, they might not be that happy with you because they might think, "Oh, this guy's going to steal work from me." So the best thing to do is to and and this works also to then get your foot in the door with every other musician is to find a drummer, befriend him or her, and tell them you are available to sub. Because everybody needs a sub and subbing for theater sucks because you have to put in pretty much the same amount of work as everybody else. And instead of playing 15 performances or 20 performances and getting paid for 15 or 20 performances, you play one or two or three or whatever that person needs to sub out. So you learn the show and you go do it once or maybe twice, you know, whatever that is. But if you're willing to do that work, that's a great way to get your foot in the door. Obviously, you got to you show up and do it. Not only does the drummer like you because, you know, he or she got to go and, you know, spend a night with their family or take another gig or whatever it was that they needed to sub it out for. But now you've spent an evening with the music director and everybody else in the band. And now, you know, now that trust starts to build. And and I've gotten a lot of gigs out of, you know, out of that uh, as well. So um, so there you go. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. You Makes got sense. it. Yeah. Yeah. It it's, it's just you know, networking. Right. Get yourself out there. Yeah. yeah. And don't be a dick. Uh, I know that's easy to say. I definitely fail at this test all the time because I have opinions and I'm, I'm all too happy to share them. But, you know, in general, you are there to serve a purpose. And uh, if you can show up and the drums get played properly for the show and you leave and there was no friction or even, you know, anything that, that caused anybody to have to stop and think about something for a moment. That's the, that's the person people want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, um, well, it's like, a stressful uh, thing and there's, you know, there's no time to fix things on the fly. So you have to be that type of person yes. that can just deliver the goods. And just so, deliver the goods and walk out and kind of like being a studio guy, right? I mean, it's basically, thing. if you get hired to be a studio guy and time is money. And if you can't deliver the goods in, a finite amount of time and in, in under an expected amount of time, if somebody else can, that's a better investment. It's a better investment. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So cause as little friction as possible. And this is definitely a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing. Um, <laughs> you know, there you go. <laughs> I'm just not good at keeping my mouth shut, Paul. It's, it's, you know, I have ideas. I want to share them. What, so what about doing those gigs appeals to you? The, the stress and tension of getting it on such little preparation? That's a good question. Um, I, yes, I do like, uh, you know, I've only been doing the theater thing again now for what, four years, maybe five. I don't know. Maybe it's longer than that. Um, and certainly, you know, getting to exercise that part of my brain, right? I had no other opportunity where I had to read music or anything like that. So being able to do that and, and you know, refreshing that skill and reminding myself that I even had that skill and, and all of that is great. The pressure of it really becomes a very meditative thing when the when the music is difficult enough that I get lost in playing it. I, I a good litmus test for me is if we get to the end of the first act or even the end of the, the, the show, and I am surprised when I see at the end of the page, it says end act one, you know, and we're, and we're now, you know, four shows into the thing. It's not the first time we're playing it to me. That's a really good thing. And it happens a lot where, you know, you're just totally in it. It's a, you know, it's a dance that you're doing going through and there's all these moving parts and, you know, you got to keep your wits about you, but you still got to play the parts right and make them groove nice and feel good while also being exactly the right thing at the right time. There's a lot. So, yeah. 
That's <clears> the part I like. Uh, the other part I like is, you know, I get to set up my drums once and I don't have to load in and load out. When you finish the gig, you're out the door within about three minutes. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. Um, the things I don't like about it, and I'm becoming a lot more particular these days about which types of theater gigs I take, is I don't like not interacting with the uh, with the the cast, the people that I'm actually playing with, you know, it's really weird doing these theater gigs, you know, as a, as a rock guy uh, who's used to full interaction and all of that. It, it's really weird. Like that, the, that first theater show I did in uh, October, if then I, I have yet to meet most of the cast mm. and it's weird. You know, I mean, we did five shows together and, and two rehearsals before that, uh, and so that, you know, that part's just, and it's normal. Like you, you have to accept that going in if you're taking a traditional theater gig. I'm not sure how many more traditional theater gigs I will choose to take. Um, I've, I've basically made it clear to the, in a nice way, but, you know, to the folks that, that I work with that, yeah, you know, for the most part, like I don't, I don't do this particular thing for the money. Um, theater gigs can take up a lot of time as evidenced by October. Um, I, and I, I want to, I want to be engaged. I don't, you know, if the simplest answer is, is the, is the band on stage? If the band's on stage, then obviously I can see the people that I'm, I'm supporting and we're interacting. It's fine. I don't necessarily have to be on stage. Uh, I don't necessarily need to be involved in the show. Like I was like with Breck tones or even bloody, bloody Andrew Jackson a couple of years ago. Um, but I want to be able to interact. I don't need to necessarily interact with the audience, but I want to feel like I'm interacting with the cast and, and, you know, mm -hmm. there's people singing these songs I'm playing, people dancing to these songs I'm playing. I want to be able to hear them and see them and see what they're doing and watch their feet and all like, there's a lot there that, uh, that you really miss out on being, you know, squirreled away in a pit. I don't even like watching them on a video screen. Like I've had that option like, Oh no, we'll put a screen up so you can see them. It's like, yeah, but, that there's still it's like I'm, I'm watching TV and not playing <laughs> music with these Live people. Music, yeah. yeah. And I, I, this is me, right. I certainly don't begrudge anybody that chooses to be a theater pit musician. Don't, you know, Kevin, don't take this the wrong way. If this is what you want and you're comfortable with all this, that's great. I've just found that the enjoyment factor when compared with the, you know, the time away from my family and sort of all the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the show that you brought up, Paul, is not, you know, mostly usually falls into the not worth it category for me. Mm. Um, but I do like a show like the Brecktones where we were, you know, the band was part of the show. We weren't, we didn't, I mean, I had some lines ish, but you know, I wasn't a main character in the show by any stretch of the imagination. Like the, the, you wouldn't have even listed the band that way, but we were involved, you know, and, and engaged and that's fun for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Madhouse, similar thing. The band's on stage. It's fun. I'm doing, I, you know, I'm committed to, oh, no, actually, I haven't signed the contract, but um, but I'm doing a musical called Hedwig and the Angry Inch, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, they're doing like four or five nights at. But that one, it's about, the, Hedwig is the lead singer of a rock band, and the rock band's on stage. And, you know, there's- What are these contracts you speak of? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Um, when we do the, when I do a theater gig, I am, uh, it, it, it's always, you know, contracted out so that you, it, it's very clear, you know, when rehearsals are, what you're being paid, what's expected of you, you know, all of that stuff so that there's, so that, because there's so many people involved. I mean, even Hedwig, it's a small show, but there's probably still 15 people involved, right? They need to know everybody's going to show up on time. So, so there's, yeah, there's contracts put out for that stuff. And the contract is, um, the contract describes some remedy if you don't do what you're supposed to do as a musician. Yes. Yeah. Essentially you don't get paid. I mean, that's, God. that's, that's all, right. all they can They, I mean, yeah, they can't, I guess they could try and sue you for, you know, ruining the production, but I've never seen that in a, in a contract. Yeah. 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 It's just, here's, here's what we expect of you. And, you know, then, you know, at the end we pay you or we pay you in the middle, like what, you know, whatever the, whatever the arrangement is. Yeah. So I asked you, you know, what, where the juice was for this. And while you were talking, I was thinking about the, something that's been on my mind about the, of the different things I do. I do a trio. I do solo. I do a duo. I do a band. I am going to, for the first time next year, 
do a backing band. So I have a gig that's been a solo gig that they asked if it would be a full band. So I put together some some guys and sent them the list and said, show up, you know, that this rock and roll fake book thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You right. know what, you know what gets me the most juice? Playing with people with the exact same musical dictionary reference huh. that I have. And uh, you know, I, I play with a lot of great guys and great people and I enjoy the friendships and I enjoy making music with friends, but it's, uh, it's when you've been listening to the same, not only albums, but bootlegs of albums. And you catch that little thing that makes the song jump because yes. you're such a fan of that type of thing. When you have a full band. And I think this is a little more common when, uh, when, when you're younger and you form bands, you, cause you, you know, you, you kids are, at least when we were kids, you know, you'd listen to the same radio stations right. and you'd listen to a lot of these things and you'd want to do the same types of things. Cause a little harder, you know, as, especially in the semi-professional realm, you're kind of picking from a pool of available people, not, yes. not people who are exactly who you want. Right. But it's not, it's not, you're sitting around with your friends and then saying, Hey, we should well, learn we should instruments and start yeah. a band. Right. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. no, I, that's true. I, I don't disagree with you. When you first said that, I thought, Oh man, no, that's not what I like at all. But I, and I think I would get bored of that if it was all I did playing music with people that, that share, you, you know what I mean? Because I do like the, the, the variety of things that aren't my ideas or, you know, not the things that I just naturally would bring to the table, but there is definitely a great level of comfort, especially on like a pickup gig is sort of what I'm thinking when, you know, somebody calls a tune that I just know, you know, there's like no way that I'm not going to know every word and every guitar part and all of it. It's like, oh, yeah, this is fun. It, you know, but it, it, it's the enjoyment of hearing that song. Well, right? We had a couple of those things when we played, you know, in our pickup band. Right. We had a couple yeah. of those moments where it, your your common musical dictionary merges. Intersex. Yep. And and some magic happens because not only is the expression of the song in a cover, you know, really joyful, but, you know, kind of that 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 knowing that you're connecting on that level that something that's been a part of you has also been a part of your friend and yeah, then you know yeah. then you express it musically it's kind of a really cool thing out here you know again I, this is i play with a lot of people i i love my musical friends but one guy comes to mind which is joe my drummer mm -hmm. him and i like the exact same music you know he was a drummer in the house rocker for many years him and I listened to the same music. We Our conversations were like two people who grew up. And Joe's actually a little bit older than me. And he was more of a, a student of the Stones and the Beatles. But what a student he was. I mean, I learned so much. And I love this music and I thought I knew it. But listening to him and the things that he would pick out it. And this music would just come out of him. And, you know, obviously when we got together and we played the Springsteen stuff, he would know this stuff so cold. And it was just... It just, I guess what happens is it feels natural. I mean, it's, yeah. and it's thrilling in that it feels natural. It's, it's like, it's like I'm playing the drums. It's like what I heard is someone else is doing. You yeah. know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get, yes. I, it, and I think you're right. It, you learn, well, you'd sort of naturally take that for granted when you're, you know, much younger and then, you know, you do, you go through this experience where you just play with people that are different and doing different stuff. And when you do find someone that happens to hear either all music or even just a song the same way you do, and they play it the way you would have played it, yet there's this connection that's like, oh, yeah. we're brothers from another mother. Like, this is well, you great. Know, you said you get bored of it. I guess, I guess I get that because, you know, there are also those moments when you're literally making music. You're a little out of your comfort zone. Correct. And someone else is doing something. Um you know, I, I would say that like the different people have come through the house rockers. Russ is a really good example of that, you know, Russ's tempos are, you know, he's a groove machine Yeah, and he plays them a little bit differently. And, and I, I've told him this since he's been back in the band, um, he plays uh, smooth and superstition, you know, two very different styles, right? Yeah. He plays them in that way. And I, I've rediscovered those songs and, you know, fell back in love with them again. So that's, that's kind he of has, a cool thing. Too. Yeah. He has a, Russ has a different, Joe definitely had a swing to his playing, but he had that rock swing to his playing or has that rock he was, swing. To he his was playing. Ringo where Ringo meets Max Weinberg yes. and, and a little bit of Charlie for attitude. Right. Right. There's that, there's that rock swing that kind of happens with, with those, with those players. And Joe absolutely has that. Whereas Russ 
has more of the funk swing in in the way that he plays. And and there's a bounce to both of them. And obviously, you know, you you you've borne witness to the fact that crowds react and move to both different styles of of drummer, but it is a different thing. Yeah, for well, sure. I'll tell you, we played Enter Sandman on Halloween and Russ was a metal drummer on par with the best of them. I mean, yeah, he was that, crushing it. So that metal stuff has a swing to it, too. I, in fact, all good music has a swing to yeah. it, even if it's at, not, like I don't mean like, you know, ding, ding, a ding, ding, a ding. It, it, it's got to have a little bit of a bounce. You've got to feel where the where the beat is, even if it you're playing something like, you know, some Mahavishnu tune in, in 14. Like it, that also has a swing to it. You got to feel the pulse, even if the pulse is, you know, intentionally abnormal. There, there's that pulse that's got to that's got to have its bounce to it. And yeah, I guess it's just two, it's a yin and yang, right? I yeah. mean, there's the there's the comfort and joy of a common musical expression. Yes, there's the thrill of exploring something new musically. And you know, may, maybe as I said it, I was I was just reflecting on a magical moment that comes from playing Absolutely. with people who have the same thing. But, uh, you know, there's lots of magical moments. I mean, again, we're going in new ways with the house rockers now, new music, new sounds, new arrangements that are delighting and surprising me. I mean, we play, we play, I think five Bruno Mars songs, not what I would listen to on the radio, right. but you know, you find, I find, you find it in two places. You find it in the music making when the band connects to it. And then you find it in the reaction from the audience where, where, you know, you don't know until you put it out there. I mean, like we've had stuff that we put a lot of time in yeah. and then when you put it out, you know, to the audience, we think it's great. And then you put it out <laughs> the audience and it's flatter than wah, you would think it'd be wah, surprisingly. Wah. So, yep. yeah. Oh yeah. You learn. Yeah. There's humbling moments uh, all the time. Yep. Yeah. But that's yep. okay. Like that's, you know, that, that's what makes those magical moments actually magical. Right. Is, mm. is that is you have to have the, like you said, the yin and the yang, you got to sort of balance it out. If everything was just amazing, nothing would be amazing. You wouldn't know. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, you know, like you got to have something true. to compare it to. So, yeah. 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 Fun. Cool. Well, that's all I got for today. You got anything else, man? Nope. Got okay. two done in a week. Oh, I did want to tell you, Nick went to Vegas and saw Fish on Halloween. I don't know what album they covered. Did you figure it out yet? God, those freaking guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't have it in front of me because it. So here's the thing. It, Fish does this musical costume. Right. Uh, and they they don't do it every year, but they it's, they've done it many, many times. And th the idea is that instead of wearing costumes, uh, they will learn an album by someone else. And on Halloween, they play instead of playing two sets, which is what they do for the normal shows. They play three. And the second set is this musical costume and the first, and they've all, they always try to make it a mystery, right? So that you have, you have to guess. And one year they had people vote and they've done albums. The first one they did was the white album. They did Quadrophenia. They did exile on main street. They did Dark Wait, side of the moon. Uh, not so dark side of the moon was done. The show after Halloween, they did the Velvet <laughs> Underground's Loaded. Everybody expected them to do Dark Side. Then the shows after Halloween, they went to like Utah. The place was half full and they decided, all right, tonight, let's play Dark Side of the Moon and, you know, just F with people. So um, and they did Waiting for Columbus. And so they, they do this. Right. And uh, they did uh, Remain in Light, Talking Heads uh, one year. But anyway, so this year they're doing it again or they did it again on Wednesday night. And. The, uh, you know, there's all these mysteries. What's it going to be? You know, it's going to be Led Zeppelin. They're finally going to do Led Zeppelin. You know, okay, great. It's fine. And they hand out a playbill on Halloween when you get to the venue that uh, describes what you're going to hear. You know, that they, they don't, they didn't do it for the first one because the White Album was, they, they sort of, they teased Dark Side of the Moon at, at the beginning of Breathe and or the, they teased the beginning of Breathe and then went into uh, Back in the USSR. And this was like in 1994 or something like that. But anyway, uh, so that now they hand out these playbills and they get this playbill. And I got home from my Madhouse gig on the East Coast here. And Fish was still in set break after their first one because Lisa said to me, she's like, did you know here what Fish played? I said, no. And so I look online and somebody is, you know, they, they, they haven't started the second set. So we don't know. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Fish posted a link to the, you know, to the PDF of this playbill. Great. So we look and it's this whole playbill describing this obscure Swedish electronica band. And it's like, <laughs> what in the heck? And I'm reading this playbill. And then there's an article about, you know, how fish 
you know, how this band means a lot to them and all this stuff. And I'm reading it and I'm like, at least this sounds like BS. Like the, these guys are making this They're up. Messing with you. They're yeah. messing with us. Right. And there's a track list in the thing and everything. And so I go back on Twitter and I look to see how people responded to, to fish's tweet. Cause it's been out for like five hours now. Right. And I figure, okay, pe- people have sussed this out. And sure enough, this one woman that I found, she had gone online, she searched this stuff and there were, there were articles from like 10, 15 years ago about this band, but they were few and far between. In fact, there were only three of them. And she checked the internet archive way back machine and confirmed that these articles did not exist until 24 hours prior. So it's like, okay, what's going on here? You know, what's it going to be? And then fish came out dressed in white suits all of their instruments were white, like white drums, white guitars, white keyboards, white stage white monitors, monitors. Wh- yeah. right? Everything was white, white cables. Like, I, I have no idea what they spent to get a mini Moog in all white and a, <laughs> a Leslie in all white and a Hammond, a B3 in all white. This is crazy. It looks it looks bizarre the, the, just seeing the stage with, with them on it. But um, and then they came out and they proceeded to play these 12 songs that had the titles of this, this, you know, BS Swedish band. And clearly these are songs that fish wrote for Halloween (laughs) and, uh, and just, and they're, you know, they sound like fish songs, but there's also sort of like weirdly, you know, eighties electronica inspired. And they just came out and did that. And then they left the stage and everything changed back. And the third set was just like normal fish again. Good to go. Crazy. Yeah. Somebody posted something, they, they said, uh, you know, it's taken me 30 years, but I finally figured out that the only reason this band exists is to entertain those four guys. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, that's correct. So, yeah, Fish did their Halloween thing. And I, like, I, I, I'd be curious as I, I listen to it. Uh, I have a great friend who the morning after every Fish show, the show just shows up in my email box. It's it's actually quite, quite delightful. If I, so if I want to listen, it's right there. But um, so thank you, Gary. You rock. But uh, uh, so I Send listened. Nick a note. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, uh, now that I know he was there, I'm, I'm curious, like what his interpretation of, of this, you know, thing was while he was in the midst of it, because things are always different when you're in attendance and, and all that. But yeah, we listened to the songs actually while we had dinner last night. And I was like, yeah, OK. Huh. I mean, some of them are good. Some of them will last. And that, but that's true of every Halloween album. Like, you know, they did the Velvet Underground's Loaded. I saw that one actually in Vegas 20 years ago. And it was, it was for me now, I'm not a big Velvet Underground fan, but it was the worst Halloween album for them to pick. Cause you know, they're all like three chord songs and, yeah. and they wanted to stretch them out. And as it turns out, I think the band was on mushrooms that night. It just wasn't a good, it, it was a bad choice. And, uh, but there was one song that, that was great. Rock and roll was like, when they started that, it was like, Oh, okay. This sounds good. I bet this will stick around in the set. And sure enough, it, you know, it, they play that song, you know, it, it's in the, the normal rotation of songs that they play. And same with like drowned from Quadrophenia. Like that's just like, yep. Okay. That's a fish song. Great. Good to go. And you know, so there'll be some from this fictitious album that stick around and they still play and that'll be fine. You know, be good, whatever, more, more material for them to play with. Again, that woman was right. The the band or the person, I don't know, this band exists to to entertain them. That's it. <laughs> and you're just along for the ride. Just along for the ride. That's it. Yep. So there you go. All right. Well, there. That's that. Got anything else, man? That's enough. Hey, I know one thing. Yeah. Always be performing, Dave. Oh, yeah, man. You too. Always be performing. That is my my wish and hope for everyone here. Have a good week, folks. We'll see you next time. See ya. Let me know if uh, you're in L.A., because I'll be in L.A. next week, folks.